Um, that you joined us today for this discussion about the future of housing finance reform. And uh, it is even a, a greater pleasure to be able to introduce our keynote speaker, Adolfo Marzal, who is currently senior advisor at HUD, but has a long history of uh, work in mortgage finance, uh, including some time uh, spent in the private mortgage uh, insurance industry at Essent. Uh, years as both Chief First Officer and Executive Vice President at Fannie Mae, and also time at uh, Chase Manhattan Mortgage. Uh, so he is perhaps the most knowledgeable person in America on mortgage finance, and we will benefit from his words of wisdom today. So please welcome to the podium. Adolfo. Wow, that intro was a total setup. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. It's really really appreciate that. Um, and, and thank you everyone. It's actually, uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you. Um, a, a, an honor to keynote uh, this panel discussion. Um, as Doug mentioned, um, since last May, I have had the uh, privilege and the honor of serving as a senior advisor to HUD Secretary Dr. Ben Carson. Uh, it's a pleasure to serve the Secretary and he's assembled a great team. It's a pleasure to be part of that team. Um, the support that I provide to the Secretary and the HUD team is very much shaped uh, by my uh, career as a mortgage practitioner, 30 years in the private sector. Um, as Doug mentioned, it primarily focused on single family finance, mortgage finance and risk man management. Uh, as Doug kindly pointed out, I've been unable to hold one steady job. Um, so um, I've meandered around a bit, but I think the value add of that meandering around is that I've seen the mortgage business from a variety of standpoints. I started with a, uh, a smallish uh, independent mortgage banker, so I've seen it from that side. Uh, I was a senior officer at a uh, top 10 big bank owned mortgage company. I was at Fannie Mae. I've been an advisor to a number of different uh, entities in, in the system, uh, to Wall Street firms, to home loan banks. And then in 2008, I was blessed to have the opportunity to be one of the members of the founding management team of Essent, which was um, the first of a number of new private mortgage insurers that got started in the wake of the crisis. Um, and it's funny to think back to 2008, you know, if you, were, if you put your mindset back to where we were in 2008, it's hard to think about, it's hard to envision that we would get to where we are today with an economy this strong, with a housing market uh, that's this robust, and I think that that's something to be thankful for. Um, it's clear that six years of uh, rapidly rising home prices have had a, uh, brought some really much needed healing to the housing market, although I think we have to be honest and say that the, the financial losses and the emotional losses that a lot of families uh, suffered are never going to be are never going to be made whole. Um, at HUD, we have a pretty big position in the single family uh, housing finance system uh, through our uh, two main programs, FHA and Ginny May, in terms of supporting the single family housing finance system. Uh, FHA today is about 1.2 trillion dollars and 8 million loans. Um, Ginny May, I just looked in May, I think we can officially round Ginny May up to $2 trillion uh, in total guaranteed mortgage-backed securities. Um, and I think we've, we've demonstrated under Secretary Carson a lot of leadership in making reforms that were needed uh, in our programs. And the policy approach that we've tried to bring under the direction of the Secretary is to fulfill our mission while... Um, you know, fulfill our mission, provide access to credit, but do it in a way that's sustainable, that our programs are sustainable, and do it in a way that we protect taxpayers. And I thought I might just touch on a few of the, a few things that we've, we've worked on that I think are worth noting. Um, number one, I want to highlight the work of our Ginny May team. Uh, they've done an exceptional job in supervising and policing um, outlier prepayment behavior, really by just a very small number of issuers in the Ginny May program. Um, and that work was, was to, you know, the, the impetus of that work was to protect veterans because that's what we were seeing a lot of prepayment uh, activity. Um, but a side effect has been that we've seen the Ginny May security trading and the Ginny May security improve. Investors have renewed confidence in how that security is going to perform and greater predictability. And what it's done is it's, it's, it's tightened spreads on the Ginny May MBS. And we've really given a rate cut 
and at a time of rising rates, but we've really given a rate cut to everybody who's being financed by the GMA program at no cost to taxpayers because our team put in place, you know, not only the monitoring to know what was going on, but the courage to act uh, and, 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 and protect the integrity of a program in which our security is shared, you know, by a wide number of issuers. Um, second, over at FHA, some very significant actions as well at FHA to, to protect taxpayers and to protect the fiscal condition of the mutual mortgage insurance fund. We have a fiduciary responsibility to uh, protect the fund and to have the fund meet a, at least a 2% statutory capital uh, obligation. A um, couple things of note there. At the very beginning of the administration, the prior administration announced a significant premium cut for FHA. Our administration held that premium cut in abeyance. And when we crunched the numbers and, and, and looked at our, our 2017 annual report to Congress, had we allowed that premium cut to go through, we would not have made the 2% capital requirement that FHA must meet. We would have been at 1.76%. Um, so that was a very impactful, uh, I think an important and right decision. In addition, um, and if you look at the Mutual Mortgage Insurance Fund, um, as of as fiscal 2017, our capital ratio was 2.09%. That's really kind of a tale of two cities. Our forward mortgage program is in relatively good shape with an over 3% capital ratio. But for the first time, we gave taxpayers some very significant transparency, and we broke out the capital ratios completely between the forward mortgage program and the reverse, the HECM program. And you know what those numbers showed is that the HECM program was in pretty tough uh, financial shape, and that we needed to take some important actions to get the HECM business, at least the new business, on a better financial footing. Um, and we're seeing the new business start to come in under the new business terms. I'm encouraged that we, we have put the new business on sounder footing. We still have a large legacy book that we're going to have to manage through there. And third, I just wanted to note FHA's um, ended the practice of accepting new loans where we know that loan has a PACE obligation on it. And I wanted to flag that because I really think that's just absolutely was a common sense reform. Um, we should never have been putting taxpayers in a position where we were extending FHA financing on a property where we knew that there was a home improvement obligation in position to prime FHA's you know, first lien mortgage position. Um, New developments, we're very pleased, I would say better late than never, that the recent confirmation of Brian Montgomery, I can already tell, spent a little time with Brian, that his, his experience and his leadership, his background both at FHA and in industry is going to be a very positive development for the team. Um, part of the work that we're doing to try to ensure um, that we've got an environment that supports responsible home ownership is, is vigilance for, for kind of warning signs in the marketplace. We're seeing some risk trends in the current market that are somewhat of a concern. Um, particularly, I would note first-time home buyers. I think that uh, what's happening with first-time home buyers is they are being, um, they're being hit with dual headwinds. Uh, the good news of strongly rising home prices over the last six years, if you're a first-time home buyer, you haven't been in the market, you haven't been building up that equity, you don't have the benefit of that equity buildup. At the same time, interest rates have risen some. And so first-time home buyers to try to get into the marketplace, I think, are being put in a position of having to stretch a bit. Uh, we're seeing that in a couple of ways. One way is through our debt-to-income ratios at FHA. Uh, our average debt-to-income ratio has now risen to about 43%. Uh, we've got roughly one in four borrowers now uh, in our most recent data that have a debt-to-income ratio about 50%. So that's something we're taking a look at. Uh, down payment assistance has, has increased as a share of new purchase money business. Some forms of down payment assistance are, are you know, post higher risk to the fund. And then on the refinance side, we're seeing more borrowers who are doing a refinancing with FHA, taking cash out of their, of their property. So um, we're seeing a kind of a rising share of cash outs. And interestingly, uh, more than about half of our ref cash out refis are actually borrowers whose current loan is, a, is in the conventional market, is a Fannie or Freddie loan, and they're coming over to FHA uh, to cash out. So those are some trends. We've noted these before. These aren't, these aren't new news, um, I, but we're monitoring them closely. We want to really make sure that our credit box at FHA is you know, set in a way 
that fulfills our mission, but that we do it responsibly, we do it sustainably, so that we have successful home ownership and we're positioning people for, you know, for success and for wealth creation over time in that home. Um, I know today's panel is about housing finance reform. You're going to talk about big, you know, broad and important issues there. I, I just want to make sure that on the agenda, if our panel doesn't talk about it, at least the people in the room are thinking about it, that a critical element of, we think, a critical element of housing finance reform, and think it ought to be a broadly shared perspective, is the need to modernize the risk management and technology platforms at FHA. Um, I can tell you coming from the private sector and looking at where we are from an operational, technological, and risk management capability, you know, the FHA of today is behind the Fannie Mae of 12 to 15 years ago when I was there. Um, and so I think that, the, you know, the differences now between FHA and, say, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are, you know, are truly stark. Um, we really are in the dark ages. Uh, our, we're running on uh, mainframe uh, platforms. We're still drowning in paper, getting you know thousands and thousands of paper case files being sent into our home ownership centers. Um, you know, every, every, every year, uh, our systems aren't re very reliable. We have outages, uh, and they're expensive to maintain. So you you not only it's like the, a double whammy of the stuff is, is old and isn't working very well, and yet maintaining old you know, software and old technology and being on mainframes uh, is expensive, and, and, and the, the brain power that knows how to do all that is, is slowly winding down. So we have to jump to a modernization strategy. I know Brian Montgomery uh, is, is, feels very strongly about this, is very passionate about it. Um, and I guess the way I was going to put this issue is whether... Whether, as you think about the future, you would put relatively more importance on getting borrowers into homes and having access to credit through FHA, or whether you relatively would be more concerned about the risks of FHA, the risks that a $1.2 trillion program might represent to taxpayers. Whatever, whatever side of those, if your relative weight is more on one or the other, um, the case for the modernization of FHA, I think, is compelling on, on, on both sides of that. And we're kind of heartened by what we've seen as a kind of a growing understanding of that issue and, and growing support for, for taking uh, actions that need to be taken. So we want to take some q and I'm just going to wrap it up here. I thought I'd wrap it up on a little bit of a personal note. Uh, I came to this country uh, when my parents fled the Castro Revolution in Cuba, so I came as a as a little child, I would say, God bless mom and dad for the courage to leave, and, and God bless this country for having us. Um, my, my beautiful Cuban mother still lives in the first house that mom and dad bought in the, in the middle 1960s, so over 50 years ago. So yes, I'm one of those people that when he goes home to visit mom, sleeps in that little room in the back of the house you know, that he grew up in. And my seventh grade science award plaque is still hanging on the wall, and I'm pretty proud of that. Um, and I bring all that up to say, you know, that house, you know, it was a roof over our heads and four sturdy walls. And I have to tell you, compared to some of the places we rented before we bought the house, there was a lot to be said about a solid roof and four sturdy walls. But, you know, for us, that house, you know, it meant a lot more than that. It meant, it meant things like safety, it meant permanence, it meant belonging, it meant a better future. Uh, for our family, and I know we're not the we're not the exception. I think that's more the rule in terms of what home ownership means. You know, has meant to millions of families. It's going to mean to millions of families, and you know that's why we're working hard at HUD to try to ensure that you know our our, our key programs that support this market and, and help make home ownership possible are managed in a way that they can fulfill their mission responsibly. Uh, today and, and for the years ahead. So with that, um, I'll just say again, thank you, Doug. Thank you, American Action Forum, uh, for the opportunity to keynote, and I'm delighted to, to take a few questions. Thank you. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand, uh, and then uh, identify yourself, ask your question in the form of a question with a question mark at the end. The floor is open. Isaac, one way to mic. Uh, thank you, Isaac Boltanski from Compass Point. 
Um, would you speak a little bit, last year you were at Lori's event and you talked a little bit about the actuarial report and some of the changes and also conceptual differences in terms of how you manage a fund. Do you manage it to 2% and hoping you just don't go under or do you actually shore it up a little bit? Will you talk a little bit about possible changes or how you're conceptually thinking about the actuarial report as it comes out? Right now, as I think about the actuarial report, my thoughts are a lot more tactical. <laughs> Um, I'm really hoping and wanting us to be above 2%. Uh, I think we have some headwinds and some tailwinds on that. Um, in, terms of the, in terms of the tailwinds, um, home prices have continued to appreciate um, you know, pretty solidly, 6 to 7% over the last year. Um, that's going to be beneficial, I think, overall to the fund and, and, and um, you know, to the sort of the condition of the borrowers in the fund. Um, I think the changes we made to the reverse mortgage, and they took some time to take effect. So we made changes back in September of last year, and lenders, the reverse mortgage lenders, had a pipeline of business, you know, you know, in process under the old business term. So it wasn't like we made a change and then overnight everything went to the new business terms. It's been a period of months of winding down the pipeline under the old terms. You know, and, and, and winding up the new. So the new business, I think, as that starts to come in, I think that will be, you know, that will be helpful. In terms of um, headwinds, um, we had some really big storms hit the country last year. Uh, and, you know, you know, a large areas uh, affected. And I think particularly Puerto Rico, uh, where you really had a 10-year economic uh you know, you've already you'd already been in tough economic times for about 10 years, uh, and so the disruption in Puerto Rico, I think, is going to be, you know, more substantial. And the recovery is going to be slower than 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 Florida and Texas. And if you read the report, you knew that what, when we issued the report, uh, the report did not factor in any financial impact from the hurricanes. We were not in a position at the time it was issued to kind of estimate that impact. So we've got puts and takes, uh, and you know the, the risk team there and, and the actuaries are going to be working hard over the coming months to kind of frame, frame where we're at and, and, and hoping that we will continue to be above the 2%. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative. Uh, the administration put a, an enormous focus on improved economic growth, something that's been, yeah, it's been about 2%. They're aiming for three. Certainly, this year the CBO estimates year four reports to be three point three. How much does that underpinning improve the outlook for like the MMI or, or the, the book of business you have at HHI? Um, I think the I think it's meaningful, um, and I think it's showing up. You know, just from an analytical perspective, you know, primarily shows up in home price appreciation. And what I'm what I'm hoping is, in a sense, that 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 our home the home price appreciation we're seeing, which has been strong and has been outstripping earnings growth now for for a, for a period of time, you know, I'm hoping that income growth, you know, will catch up to and support so that what we're seeing really is fundamental home price appreciation supported by jobs and income, you know, getting there the right way, um, you know, as opposed to maybe you know too much liquidity in the system. So I think it's important, and um, you know we'll uh, we will continue to monitor it. But if we continue to have decent home price appreciation, it, it will be supportive for the fund. Speaking of modernizing risk management, supposing we're in a business cycle, and the business cycle maybe it's roaring right now, but supposing that you're tipping point downwards, is HUD taking that into consideration? Yes, and in fact, if you looked at the uh, 2017 annual report, uh, one of the sections that we put a lot of time in and talked a lot about in the report is we provided not just a point estimate. You've got to remember what this capital ratio is. It is literally a single point, single path estimate. That's not credit risk pricing. It's doing a calculation, an important calculation, but it's doing a calculation. We gave... Um, we took historical economic scenarios around home prices and interest rates and we applied them to the book of business and we gave a hundred scenarios, a hundred historically based scenarios and we provided for folks the distribution 
you know, of outcomes. And we spent a lot of time talking about the fact that our baseline projections, particularly for the forward mortgage program, draw from, you know, we're, we're modeling a fairly benign economic outlook. And the, the mortgage risk hasn't changed. Mortgage risk remains a, a fat-tailed risk. Lots, lots of your draws will be relatively positive, and then you know, a small number of them can, can be very, very painful. And I think that that's a, a, a thought process. That's my, my background and experience is rooted in that. I try to bring that perspective to our internal discussions. So you, uh you talked about incomes hopefully catching this is up. This Lorraine Wolder. Lorraine Wolder with Clinico. You talked about incomes hopefully catching up with home price growth. Um, other than that, well, you know, what is the administration doing, if anything, to um, improve affordability and access? Um, of course, we have the mortgage programs, um, but increasingly it's a supply problem. Uh, is there any? Are there any tools in your toolbox that you're using? I think there's, there's definitely an effort at HUD to look at the various roadblocks that prevent, you know, the production of affordable supply of housing and see what we can do about some of those challenges. A fair number of them are, are local. Um, and there's a variety of circumstances. Lumber prices are up. There's a lot of things that are going on. I don't know that there's a, there's a quick and easy fix. I, I suspect there is not a quick and easy fix, but I think the administration, you know, is concerned about and interested in, I know the secretary is interested in, the things we can do over time that will help loosen up the, you know, the supply of housing. Because I think if we don't get some additional supply response, and we're going to continue to be in a situation in which the market is tight and home prices are expensive and, 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 and renting is, is, is not super affordable either. So we have time for one more question. Uh, Mark Center. Um, now, given your experience in both the private sector, at the GSEs, and, and now at FHA, do you foresee a time when there will be a better coordination of efforts on overall housing finance policy? Well, I, I'd say a couple of things. Um, I think we had some terrific coordination with the GSEs and the hurricane response. I think that was an excellent coordination. Uh, across a whole bunch of federal agencies and the GSEs working with FHFA. And I think so that was an example. Uh, in fact, I remember going home and telling my wife, you know, today I saw good government at work because we had everybody at the table sharing information, discussing the issues, and trying to figure out what was the best thing we could do for the people of Texas and Florida and Puerto Rico in response to, to, to the situation that we were facing. Um, and, you know, we've got very good, um, you know, very good dialogue within the administration, you know, on housing and housing related issues. So I'm, I, I'm personally not feeling like we have some glaring lack of coordination. We're different. There's different enterprises here. The GSEs are a set of enterprises. They have a set of statutory legislative mandates and a regulator that, you know, is overseeing them. And, and, and at HUD, we have our mission and mandate. I do think, though, would say to the question, that when you have your panel discussion, um, and the Secretary said this a number of times, thinking about housing finance reform holistically and recognizing the interconnections between the pieces um, is very, very important. That you can't, you can't do reform in silos because you're very likely to get unintended effects and consequences that maybe weren't the ones you wanted. Well, thank you, Adolfo. Join me in thanking Adolfo. Swap the, the podium out and then we'll invite the panel up. So, um, everyone. Uh, so, I'm delighted to now get the chance to thank you. Come on up, Lord. Come on. Um, introduce uh, Lorraine Roller uh, from Politico, who is currently covering the White House, but in her uh, previous duties included the financial services team where these issues were uh, the bread and butter of the coverage. She's also spent time at Bloomberg and at Business Week where she's covered a wide variety of political and legal issues, and we're delighted to have her as our moderator. And then I guess you get to introduce me the way this works. I get to introduce you? I think you get to introduce the panelists. I do. <laughs> okay. Go. Ready? Go. 
Um, I'm sure you all know Doug Holtegan. Tony Sanders is at George Mason University, where he specializes in structured finance, um, and he spent some time at Deutsche Bank, mm -hmm. right? Lori Goodman, I'm sure everyone in the new room knows Lori, um, our Washington's resident expert on everything housing from uh, structured finance again to uh, affordability and economics. Good. Thanks everyone for joining us and um, I'm just going to throw it open to the big hard question first and just try to get a conversation started. So I'd like all of you to tell us, it's been 10 years, we've all been doing this for at least 10 years talking about this. Where are we 10 years after the collapse? And name at least one good thing that's happened and one bad thing that's happened in GSE reform in the last decade. Where are we? So, um, so the good thing that's happened is that there are a lot of administrative reforms that have taken us well down the path to where everybody thought legislative reform was going to be. I think in another 10 years, will be um, basically where we are now, that is we'll have more administrative reforms and we still wouldn't have had legislative reform. I think it's really hard to do legislative reform because there's no sense of urgency. The current system is working well enough. Um, there's no consensus on what the new system ought to look like. And, there's an and then when you sort of think about the goals of um, reform, there's two goals that are inherently contradictory. On one hand, we want to put private capital first. On the other hand, we want to allow for some amount of cross subsidization in the new system. And cross subsidization, so if you're putting private capital first, it means risk based pricing, and cross subsidization either needs to be shoehorned in somehow or it needs to be placed in top. And then finally, most of the um, near consensus goals have already happened administratively. You know, you sort of think, okay, we want to preserve the 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Private capital takes the first loss, government provides a catastrophic government provides a catastrophic guarantee. Lenders large and small have access to the system. We want wide credit availability. Well, to a certain extent, we've achieved all that. We've introduced an expanded, the FHFA has introduced an expanded risk sharing to put private capital first. The common securitization platform and the single security is moving along. The GSE portfolios have been wound down and they've taken multiple steps to increase credit availability. So I think administrative reform has accomplished most of the near consensus goals of GSE reform. The one thing that hasn't been accomplished is we don't know, is there's been no clarity on who actually owns these institutions. So, and, in and in fairness, very few people care. That's a good. So Tony, that sounds pretty good. Like we, we've accomplished a lot, or? Wow. I mean, I thought we accomplished almost nothing. Okay. So there's a little bit different views of this stuff. I think, you know, we, this, we had a horrible fall in 2008 and 2009. And of course, Washington just sits there, just but lets everything just go along smoothly, nothing much has changed. I, mean, I agree with much, much of what Laurie is saying about the administrative reform part, but we're still sitting with the GSEs captured in conservatorship. The government's still drawing money from them, profit sweeps, when they can, so. It's, uh, I would rather that go away, but we'll see. And so, Doug, you called them sippies yep. today. Um, elaborate a little bit. Well, I mean, so uh, I'll answer the good news bad news thing. Uh, the good news is that the, the, the large, essentially monoline hedge funds, the portfolios has been wound down. Those were just extraordinarily dangerous uh, entities, and they proved to be catastrophic in their performance. Um, almost nothing else good has happened, in my view, uh, in that I thought this would be an occasion for more than a discussion about the GSEs, but for this larger holistic uh, uh, discussion that Adolfo talked about, where we, we would ask the question, given that we have a commitment to having people have um, housing, having shelter, which is the essential, how much do we want to have people be subsidized to own? And would those subsidies take the form of, hey, you can get some help if you borrow a lot, or we can have some other approaches, or are we gonna sort of balance the scales more with renting? We've had nothing like that. We haven't even had a, okay, let's look at the FHA and the GSEs and, and sort of figure out what, what they should do in a coordinated fashion. That hasn't happened. Uh, all, we, all we now essentially have is uh, the FHFA driving uh, housing policy without uh, genuine input from Congress. That seems inappropriate to me. And, um, you know, 
in many ways, uh, I'm worried about the, the kinds of things that Adolfo mentioned, which is you know watching the DTI, the debt to income ratios, just decline, watching house prices rise at 6% a year, an economy that's not growing at 6% nominal. Um, those little strike me as bad developments, where we just haven't taken on these institutions because we haven't figured out what their role is supposed to be. And they are cities. I mean, if you somehow release them and pretended they were really genuinely private sector entities like Sydney Group, the FSOC would have to capture them tomorrow. So, I mean, is this just a problem of Congress um, not having the, the guts to step up and make the hard decisions? Or did we um, sort of fall into this place because, you know, home prices are rising and we can all look the other way as long as the economy is improving? Like, name like a couple reasons why we're at this point. I think perversely, I've always thought this, I'm probably wrong, but I, mean, I think perversely, because the GSEs are so large and, and FHA as well, sort of, they, they have this huge share of things, no one wants to touch them for a field they'll get it wrong and they'll blow up the US housing market. So it's, it, it's just stopping reform. has for years. So, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, you know, I think we've never really looked at the housing market as the house at the housing finance system holistically, ever, ever, ever. And so you sort of um, so you've got FHA who does not do any risk based pricing. You've got the GSEs who do do risk based pricing. Not surprisingly, FHA has the bulk of the riskier borrowers. We sort of have the, the GSEs have tried to expand credit availability, but it's not clear what that means in a world in which FHA essentially captures the riskiest borrowers because they don't do risk based pricing. So we've never ever thought of this holistically. And when you do, there's a, it's a very, very, very difficult issue. Um, let me actually um, address home price increases in debt to income, if I could, for a minute. Um, yes, we've seen increases in debt to income. And by the way, every time, we've had a secular decline in interest rates for the bulk of the last um, almost 40 years, as you all know. But every time interest rates uh, have gone up during that period, debt to income ratios have climbed and home prices have also gone. <laughs> Why? Because the effects of a stronger economy and the effect, effects of inflation rearing its, its head have outweighed the fact that you're crimping affordability. And that's exactly what's happening this time, too. And you can see it in the numbers. Every time um, interest rates have gone up, home prices have risen, and debt-to-income ratios have risen. And in fact, debt-to-income is the least predictive of the measures of risk. You've got debt-to-income, you've got loan-to-value, and you've got FICO scores. If you look at a regression, what you find is that debt-to-income is by far the least, um, the least predictive, and there are a number of reasons for that. One is, the major one being that you report exactly enough income as you need to get, a, to get your mortgage application, and no more, so it's horribly mismeasured. Um, so, just to put that on the table. So, I am not concerned about the rise in debt to income ratios. Okay. And I agree with Lori that debt to income is incredibly noisy as an indicator. But this reminds me, in a sense, of 2005 through 7. We had rising housing prices, everyone's saying, don't end the party. Housing prices are going up. We're all millionaires today. And who's going to, who wants to turn the lights on in that party? So, let me just Say one other thing on that. Um, Lori, then so, um, so I think Lorraine hit it on the head during the question and answer on Adolfo, and that is supp the supply situation is just so different now than it was in 2005 to 2007. The reason home prices are going up 6 to 7% is that the net rate of new homes being created, that is if you take uh, net, net new home creation, that is single families, um, completions plus multifamily completions plus manufactured housing minus um, obsolescence, you are less than the rate of net household formation. And you are far more in 2005 to 2007. We have just a severe supply shortage that puts a huge um, wind under home price appreciation. I, I completely agree with that. I think this is a, a really big problem. And um, I, I, mean, I would agree with uh, also There's probably not a silver bullet. This is something where you're going to have to find all the levers at the federal, state, and local lever levels. But let, let's talk about this party, because we are having a yeah. party right now, okay? Yes. Um, everybody's winning, except people who can't get into home ownership. Um, the economy are not is, winning. Okay, well, we are, I think we're starting to see some overbuilding mm -hmm. in the rental market, um, so maybe that'll start changing. Um, 
but uh, no, okay. So uh, it's all at the upper end. It's all at the upper end, okay. But um, but here we are in the middle of this party. Um, you know, do you see p political pressure on? Is is it Congress is under political pressure not to fiddle with things for fear of messing it up, as you said, or is it more Congress just is um, just doesn't know what to even do? Like, there's no lead. I don't see a lot of leadership on this issue outside of industry, basically. Who's, who's the well, which politician wants to come out and vote against affordable housing? That does, that's not a good sound bite. This is what they're going to have to do. Is that, is that true? Are you saying that legislation that includes affordable housing uh, yeah, I'm saying, you component know, is undoable? I mean, it, no, not undoable. Just it's a, it's a hard road to come out and say, I want to do, I've had this discussion with you. And what, what legislation are we talking about specifically? Any housing legislation regarding reforming the housing system. Um, we were discussing this with Andy Davidson, and I said, so how much will interest rates go up if we get rid of Freddie and Fannie? And he had some estimate, and I went, really? I said, he has like 200, 300 basis point increase, and I went, no, that's not possible. I had less than 100 basis points. But I, again, that's part of the problem, is that you scare people, and say, let's get rid of Freddie and Fannie, oh my God, interest rates go through the roof. And that's, that's kind of a daunting message if it gets out there. But now's the time to, to do something like that when rates are so low, right? I would agree. Now's the time to do that. So, so again, I think the part of the conversation that just got skipped is, who do we think it is appropriate to help get into a home? And, 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 and what criteria will be applied to that? And currently, the, it's like anyone should be in a house. It's just, you know, how can we get you in? Do you want to go in? Want a house? You get your house. Um, that's not, that doesn't make any sense. So like the, the African American home ownership rate is the same as it was in the early 70s probably. And, and so we have, it hasn't moved and that's deemed as a, a, a bad thing, a failure. And if that's viewed as a political failure, then what's the solution? Throw more money into this problem somehow. And my concern has always been that the way that problem gets solved is not genuinely on the books, take some votes, appropriate it, whatever, it's done off the books through the GSEs, and it, that has come back to haunt us. And so we need both a conversation about who gets help, and there are people who deserve help, and they should get it, and how do we keep track of our commitments so that we don't end up in 2008 again. Yeah, so we need to reframe the entire conversation, like tear it down and reframe the whole paradigm. Go ahead. So, so I, you know, We've just talked about how the GSEs actually write a check to the Treasury. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, um, I'm actually, and at the same time, you know, we all agree that home ownership has historically been the best weird way to build wealth, bar none. So, we wiped out a lot of minority wealth in 2007, 2008. I'm not okay, sure. Okay, so, 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 so let me actually, <laughs> so let, I'm sure you and I have slightly different views on this. Um, but probably not too different. I think it's a, so home ownership has clearly been the best way to build wealth. However, if you can't sustain it, you're clearly worse off. Yes. And I think we would both agree with that statement of where we would come down, but there's nobody who has a 100% chance of sustaining home ownership in every set of circumstances and no one who has a 0%. And I think where we would disagree is what that cutoff should be and where the balance should be. Um, and I think we would both agree there is one, but our numbers would be slightly different. I would be more in favor of sustaining a higher rate of failure in exchange for giving more people the opportunity to build wealth. You come down slightly on the other side of that, but it's but it's but it's a different it's a difference of degree. Right. And and also, you know, I, I, I feel quite strongly about the transparency of, of having the help be on the books and something we have a commitment to collectively. So go through Congress and do it and not leave it out there with affordable housing funds that aren't appro appropriated. I mean, I think I'd probably have a lot more help than most people if we just voted on it. We're never gonna we're never gonna get this done though. Okay, hold on. So I think But but we are we are continuing to do what led to failure and in some circles that's known as insanity. So I we've actually made quite else. a few. We've actually <laughs> made quite a few changes. We've actually made quite a few changes. So first, the credit box. We're taking half the credit risk we were taking in 2001, 2003. A third of the credit risk we were taking at the height of the. Lori, are you are you saying though that that you don't see any risk right now? I mean, are you saying far less risk? I mean, you definitely see less risk than these two guys, right? Yes. But do you see? 
Are you worried, like, you know, three or four years from now, that we'll be in 2008 again? No. You're not at all? No. Okay. I think, well, first of all, we can't get to 2008 again unless we figure out how to do something about the supply situation, because we have such an acute supply shortage. And I see that as the number one problem. Because prices will continue to go up, and so we'll never up. have we'll never have a, you know a debt too much debt, um, too much leverage, basically. I think it would be right. very very hard to, to to have a high price decline, even if you have a slight even if you have a mild recession, which I know some Doug people. Is, Doug is skeptical. Yes, um, I mean, that's exactly the conversation that was being had, you know, in, in two thousand five six seven. We'll never have a home price decline. You know, I can remember being on the Financial Crisis Commission and talking to these guys about the stress test they ran. They never included house prices going down. But we, That's but not that exactly was different, stress. But that was different. We, we, were, we had a lot of overbuilding then. So, so I, I agree with on the fundamentals, the real fundamentals, supply and demand. This was a different era. I agree. I guess the thing that worries me about this is I don't think the criteria for successful housing finance policy should be we don't have another 2008. We're good. That, that, that's critical. We're not going to have. Oh, I, I do low bar. Too. Low yeah. bar. <laughs> First of all, the rest of the financial s system is much better capitalized. We're not going to get 2008 again, if only because of, of that. We'll, we'll get the same kind of contagion impacts. My personal view is it wasn't just a house price phenomenon. It was a global credit credit bubble, yes. and, and yes. that that's different. So, so I want to put that discussion aside and just say, is this sensible federal housing financial policy? And I don't think it is. So, so given, given Tony, hold on. Given we, I think we, the panel is basically agree we're not yes. going to see legislation anytime soon. No. Um, we're hopefully we'll see a bubble too soon. But what, what about administrative reform going forward? Lori's laid out what we've done so far. What do you want to see in the absence of legislation? Well, first of all, let me clarify a remark that Lori didn't like. Mm -hmm. and she was right. <laughs> all I was referring to is house price growth rates over wage growth rates are about the same as they were in two thousand five to seven. Now, it's a totally different credit market. Yeah. And this is, in fact, why I asked the Dolphin about these growth, you know, yeah. what they think yeah. about the growth outlook. But I, I think a lot of these sort of housing value versus income numbers, the problem is not the numerator. The problem has been the denominator. You've got to fix it. So, so what can we do now? We, we, we're not going to um, see legislation. Uh, we, things are not good, uh, generally. What can be done administratively? What can the administration do? Today, Mnuchin, FHA. Well, 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 things aren't. They're actually, you know, they're, 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 I mean, I agree with, um, with Doug that it's sort of insane, but it's a staple insanity. I meant insane, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what can be done? Any, what's sort of left in the toolbox? Well, first of all, they can speed up the uh, credit sharing that they've been doing. That, uh, originally, they put in under FHFA under the previous director because it's, it's been very good. But it's just really creaking along very slowly. The whole point that DeMarco is putting in there is to get all the credit into the private sector and off of Freddie Fannie's balance sheet. It's doing a better job, but it's still not there yet. That would be one way to speed it up. What's taking so long? Market appetite. When you have a guarantee, it's unclear how much people want to take when there's not the guarantee behind it. Seems like a no-brainer bet to me, but I'm not a financial person. Okay, so, so let me actually, so, I mean, I agree theoretically that, um, and I think that the credit risk transfer has been one of the crown jewels of the whole administrative reform mm -hmm. process. I think it's worked fabulously well. In 2013, let me just throw out a few numbers. In 2013, there was 90 billion of risk laid off. In 2017, um, it was something like um, 700 billion of risk laid off. Just a huge, huge increase. Um, that risk has taken, it's got moved from just doing cash stacker to doing back end, to doing other types of back end risk sharing with. Um, with institutions to doing front end risk sharing. I mean, it's been hugely, hugely successful. Um, and, and at this point, um, I actually, so right now they're laying off more than 90%, of, they're laying off somewhat more than 90% of the risk on the, um, on the low, on 30 year fixed rate mortgages with LTVs greater than 60. Then you say, well, what aren't they laying off? They aren't laying off some the risk on some of the shorter term mortgages, which are, 
pretty low risk. They're not laying off the risk on mortgages less than 60, which arguably shouldn't be laid off. There aren't very many arms or things they can lay that are high risk that they could lay off. So you've got two ways, you've got a couple of ways you could expand it. You could expand it by laying off more first loss, and it's not clear that's economically sound. I'm sorry, it's not clear that's economically profitable for them. That is, um, or that is a sound is sound is the wrong word. It's not it's not the investors would charge the, the, the JCs would pay more than it's worth to lay off could could pay more than that's worth to lay off the risk. Although it's not clear what that's, that hasn't been adequately tested. Or they can lay off more of the catastrophic, which would be very, very expensive to lay off and I don't think would be a good deal in the end. So I think, you know, I actually expect credit risk transfers to sort of flatten out with the decline in, um, with, the, with the increase in interest rates and the, um, and hence less production. I think they'll be able to sustain current volumes, but I don't think they'll be able to increase them going forward. Doug, administrative reforms? Um, so the the central issue that, that the administration, this and the previous administration has dodged, is what exactly are these things? Um, remember that uh, they have been used as instruments of federal housing policy repeatedly with harps and hamps and all sorts of uh, n new efforts um, for those reasons, because of the, the fact that they were clearly being uh, funded by the taxpayers, they were being used as instruments of uh, federal policy, the CEOs had them on the federal budget for a decade now. And the, the notion, the fiction, that they are somehow private entities that, that should deserve to make a profit, I think is get you off on the wrong foot. Because then, who cares if the GSEs lose money on things we deem to be appropriate subsidies for people to get in the housing? We don't worry about HUD losing money. We fund their, uh, their operations because we deem them. That's, that's their mission. And so I, I think the first thing you got to do is have a real discussion of what these things are. And they're not private entities. And they're never going to be again. That's fantasy. Yeah. And so then, then you would want to do, I think, some things that the Lord just said you wouldn't. I would want to put a lot of front end private risk sharing so that you get pricing by the private sector of the book of business all the time. And if you then look at that book of business and decide that despite its, its uh, risk-based pricing, you want to help those people, that's the nature of having a federal housing policy. I think we should do it. We should do it much more aggressively. The total credit risk, credit risk transfer is tiny compared to, to what's out there. And I think we should just do more. So uh, you probably just drove At the front end. I, I want the market to pick risks prices. appropriately, not in the back end. I don't want Fannie and Freddie deciding what risk the market gets to shut down. Okay, but so, but so as you drove down the share prices just now. I just I mean, crushed it as best yeah, yeah. So so but should is this so this falls in directly into Treasury's, you know, Treasury and FHFA's domain and yep. um, you know, help help us like grade them. Like it's is is Treasury um, you know, failed to step up um, on some of this. I mean we're still seeing litigation, we're still seeing lobbying by these by the shareholders, for example. Um, why you know yeah, talk about Watt's performance and Mnuchin's performance in the last year and a half, two years. It's no different than the predecessors. I mean, this has been maintained the status quo, uh, and, and that's what they've taught me, uh, because th th this is a political minefield, honestly. I mean, the private shareholders are powerful entities who, who don't like the thoughts that I just voiced, but that's for sure. I understand that. That, that is their narrow interest. But their narrow interest is not public policy, so we have to decide what we want from a policy point of view. Um, we know that um, doing anything aggressive at FHFA runs you into two political landmines. Number one, you're doing it with the executive authority, not for the Congress, and that's become a thing. And also, it's the housing market, and, and it's a central piece of American life, and you make a mistake, you don't want to be that guy. And so I, I think they've, they've all just sort of held their breath and tiptoed forward. Can I actually, so, so Doug, actually, so the new FHFA director when he comes in in January to replace oh. Mel Watt, could do exactly what you said. He could do more front-end risk transfer, mm -hmm. introduce risk-based pricing, mm -hmm. um, and what and, and if he introduced risk-based pricing, you would essentially end the cross-subsidization, or you would, you, would, you would have less cross-subsidization in current GSE pricing than you otherwise would. So let's take that a step further. So what would end up happening is you'd end up lower... 
Mm-hmm. Bingo. You I, know, I, I, know, I know the problem. As I, I, I began to give you, I we need to do all this. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. So, so, um, so the other, you know, look, if you want to blue sky this, why don't, why don't we just acknowledge they're um, uh, a, a part of the government and merge them with HUD? We're done. So let's, We just modernized the Dolphos platform. Uh, we'll, we'll open that up to questions in just a minute. I'm unlikely to be in the, in the next FHFA director. <laughs> 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 yeah, Tony's my guy. All right, but look, we are going to have the next the next FHFA commissioner most likely will be very different than the current FHFA commissioner. I mean, right? I mean, or or no. Like, I think for a long time we all kind of assumed that somebody would get it in there there. Um, after Watt leaves and start shrinking these guys, whereas Watt has basically expanded their footprint um, under his term. I mean, am I, am I, is that a bad assumption? So I think the footprint of the GSEs have been actually pretty constant at around 44% of originations. Of They're the experimenting time. with some stuff, yes, like, oh, are, Airbnb, yeah, yeah, mortgages. That's a large you know. yeah. portfolio. I think they've expanded the policy portfolio. That's, okay. Um, they've not just been a financial regulator. And that's what a conservative. Tony, what do you yeah. think is going to happen under a new Trump appointed FHFA? I, mean, I don't really have a good handle on what Trump's model is, but I would assume that he would pick somebody like DeMarco mm -hmm. if he could get a DeMarco again. I don't think, I don't think DeMarco's interested with setting fun here. Don't be somebody very much like him, a seasoned regulator who's probably not big into Fannie and Freddie. But so, but but also maybe not somebody who's ideologically bent on shrinking them, but more just maintaining. Well, it's very tough in this kind of a, a political atmosphere to have in the housing market have somebody that's a political ideologue. It's not going to cut it. Um, just before we open it up, does anybody want to say anything about Jenny May? Uh, and what's happening over there? Is it cause for concern over there with rates rising? Any? They seem to have fixed the VA problem, but I think everything they've addressed, they've done a very, very good job addressing the VA problem. Um, non-bank issuers? I think, you know, non-bank issuers are definitely, non-bank issuers are, you know, 82% of the Ginny May market. It's, you know, the banks have all fled. I think, you know, there's no one more aware than um, Adolfo and Brian Montgomery on the need to address the False Claims Act, on the need to, you know, sort of do something about the very high cost of servicing um, delinquent FHA loans. And, I, you know, um, I, I do think the banks have something important to contribute to the FHA market. It would be nice if they could come back, but they won't come back until there are some real reforms. Okay. Any questions? There must be questions. Okay, I have a one. Go ahead. Um, Michelle Myron with Wells Fargo. Uh, so if we assume that we're not going to have legislation, uh, we would like to see FHA included in overall housing finance reform. What is the most likely way for that to happen? And what can we expect to happen? Let's assume that HUD and Treasury and, and the new FHFA director are on the same page in some way. I honestly don't think it's going to happen because I just don't see how it can. I mean, I, you know, as a theoretical construct, yes, it should happen. I just don't see how you can get it done. And you, you probably got a better idea than any the three of us sitting up here on that. So. I want to make sure I understand the question. Maybe I'm, what I'm about to say makes no sense whatsoever. But any administration under the auspices of the Domestic Policy Council, for example, could convene interagency working groups that could include FHA, FHFA. Um, they they could have a presidential statement, an executive order, if necessary, of policy objectives. Right. They, and and an administration could, in principle, develop something like a coherent set of goals for those institutions. I'm going to agree with Lori about sort of how effective can you be at executing on those things. It's really, really, really hard. But that's the sensible starting point. But, I mean, don't forget, um, I think you started this conversation by saying, uh, you know, there's not a lot of um, impetus, right? Things are kind of scooting along, and we've got bigger fish to fry, maybe, in the minds of the administration, or... 
I've been, uh, been stunned by the silence from Treasury Secretary Mnuchin. I kept thinking that there were going to be leaders on this, since it's perfectly a good time to go and do something if you're going to do it. Because refi rates from GSEs are super um, near zero. But why don't we do something now? I think it's just timidity. Timidity. Yeah. I just think he's aware of the subtleties of a big and ex mortgage backed securities trader. I think he's aware of the subtleties of what he does and the repercussions of what he does, and there's no easy answer. I think that's true, too. Uh, but I have a question for you, for the panel. Can I raise my hand? <laughs> FHFA just came out with capital requirement recommendations just last week. Mm -hmm. That's kind of yeah. took me by surprise. They were supposed to have been doing it all along, but they waited 10 years. Like the song, ten years after they finally came up with a cap. What was what was the timing of that? Do you know what? It had been. Pardon? Yeah. It had been operating under capital. Yeah. Right. No, but why, why the release suddenly last week? So, I did. So I'll give you my answer, and then everyone and then. I like this part where we quiz the yeah. audience. Yeah. <laughs> this is good. Get ready. <laughs> so my answer is they've been doing it. Mm -hmm. all along. What this does is it serves to codify for prosperity and for the next um, FHFA director and the next and the next FHFA administration what they have been doing all along. And it actually sort of you can sort of see the um, implications of you can sort of see the implications of that. So if you want to change pricing you, you, know, you can at least see the the capital framework that generated the choices that have been made. Took me much less too. I'm still trying to figure it out. So uh, I think one of the themes that we're going to be discussing over the next few months is GSE charter creep. I think that you've seen examples, and Lorraine touched on this, the line of credit on MSRs, the Imagine pilot, other things. Um, and, and part of that's predicated because, at least I think, when Congress doesn't act, the enterprises are uh, willing to try new things. So we talk a little bit about that dynamic, the GSEs, and how they are becoming more aggressive, either uh, in your opinion because they should, or because they have to, or should it be something that lawmakers look into in the next Congress? Well, there's always been mission creep. Every time you have a government agency, and you're right, it, I'm not saying, well, the rats or the cats away, that kind of argument. But again, if there's just silence in Congress or kind of a few hand-swirling statements and then nothing else is done, they are going to do mission creep. It's just the nature of the beast. Keep pushing the credit envelope a little wider. Um, and they're under a lot of pressure from affordable housing groups to get more housing, affordable housing in there. Of course, in this climate, affordable housing doesn't have the same meaning it used to. Now it does mean how can we get someone in a million dollar house that is a $200 or $10,000 income? This is very tough. But is this, I mean, but is this FHFA's problem? I mean, why hasn't uh, Watt done more to constrain this? <laughs> uh, that's a rhetorical question. But but talk about mission creep a little bit. Oh, I, I think there is mission yeah. creep, and it, it, again, it goes back to to sort of how you view these entities. It, you know, if they're if they're private entities with their own capital, they can mission creep all they want, but it's not appropriate. Right. They are under conservatorship, and the, and any mission creep should be at the direction of the of no lot now and, and his successor. And I think there's a standard of transparency about that mission creep that's not being met. Like, what is it that we're going to do new and different, and why? And Congress should do oversight of that. I mean, I understand. I'm not sure I would call it mission creep. I mean, sort of. Um, Imagine is a basic, basically an outgrowth of the CRT program, which you guys were both applauding and arguing for further expansion of. Um, the servicing of MSRs is a um, is sort of an outgrowth of the fact that the market has changed, and even the GSEs are more than fifty percent non-bank origination at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the housing finance system is evolving, and the GSEs have to evolve with it. Do they? Do you think they need to be more innovative? I mean. Um, I mean, I think you know. I think they're doing a lot of experimenting, and they'll see what works and what doesn't. My point is less to judge the individual efforts than the process by which they're being done. We'll just we'll just do it. Well, it, so we're not going to say what need is not being met. Let's try this new program to meet that need. Congress, what do you think? Okay, so actually, let me take the other side of that. So there are two ways you can make change. 
One is by saying, presto, we're changing everything. The other is by doing a series of pilots where you see what works and what doesn't. So for example, you know, including Airbnb income in certain circumstances is sort of, is a pilot. Um, you know, so, um, they've got a ton of pilots out there with different organizations to see what works and what doesn't. And they I actually... Solve what problem? Which uh, they have raised their hands that uh, they have. Okay, so basically the Airbnb income addresses the, we all agree that DTI is totally non-representative of people, it is the least predictive, and one of the reasons it's the least predictive is because it's the most mismeasured. So it's a better way to capture total income. There are other things that I, that I might have put higher on my priority list, like capturing, you know, rental pay history, or you know, do, there, are, there are lots of other things I, I might have put higher on my priority list than, than Airbnb income. But that's but they deem that important, and you know, have gone after it, and, but through the use of a pilot. And I think these pilots sort of allow you to gather information on what works and what doesn't in a way that if it doesn't work, you're, you haven't like, oh my god, i got to pull it back from the whole system. And it's, a, it's done in a very non-disruptive way. So yes, I wish there were more transparency on the pilots, and I agree with you there. Right. Um, but I actually think that doing the pilots is the right way to do things. The transparency thing is, a, I think, a huge problem um, on every level. Um, and, and then we're also seeing, um, kind of take, you know, building off of Isaac's question, they're, you know, they're, they're becoming category killers. Like in retail, we have category killers, right? So now the GSEs are getting so powerful that like they can, well, we don't need appraisers anymore for certain loans. And pretty soon, you know, maybe we don't need MI for certain loans. You know, so technology so has overtaken. Maybe it's good. I'm not, I'm not judging. It's a living, breathing yeah. system. And technology, you've had huge advantage. You've had huge advances because of big data. But it's, it's privately held data. Should it be, I mean, would that be an administrative reform? Absolutely. Right. The, the taxpayers find every dollar of their business. They, they deserve to see what everything about what's going on. Any other questions? Hi, uh, Robert Revilliard with the American Land Title Association. Just a question on the transparency piece. Um, there are fairly specific um, notice and comment requirements in Hira for when the GSEs are putting out a new product. And I'm just curious if any of the panelists have thoughts on where that line should be on whether a program is a product versus a pilot and just how they should approach that. What, what sh like, should the Airbnb pilot have been noticed somehow publicly, for example? Yes. And I think, you know, t t title insurance is another place where we could start seeing them. You know, we have all the data. We don't think you need title insurance for this one. Um, but so so what can be done in terms of transparency and, and noticing? Like, what should and shouldn't be noticed? Like, is that an FHFA fix or Treasury fix? Well, I think that Mel Watt all along had the ability to go through and make the data at Freddie and Fannie and all everything available. Uh, and what's available now is far better than it was prior to 2007, but still it's a lot to still get you out there. And caution loans. There's a certain class of loans that Freddie and Fannie do not include in their database yeah. that are online. So that's not, it's about two thirds of them, I think, approximately. So there's still a third that investors can't see. Why, why are they less transparent? Is this just because, I mean, they're not doing it for the shareholders, right? Or are they? You know, what's their... No, it's not for the shareholders. <laughs> if you're reporting to Treasury and you're reporting to Congress, you're always going to be nervous about having yeah. a blood pulled. So but it's maybe I, a minutian a question. Uh, yeah, it, it, it may be... I mean, who knows how this plays out? I mean, I think the rest of the administration's regulatory reforms, the ones that have affected the cabinet agencies, have involved um, sort of standardizing measures of uh, burden, regulatory burden, giving them uh, regulatory burden budgets. And there's been talk that they could extend that to, quote, independent agencies, which you immediately think of you know, CFTC and people like that. But what if FHFA suddenly had to run things by OIRA? And what would that look like? Well, then it's not an independent. 
No, the, they're, they're talking about sweeping all of them yeah. for purposes of the regulatory reforms. And that's not a crazy idea. I mean, having a, a, a standard way to assess the burden of regulation, assess the benefits of regulation, promulgate regulations, that's a good thing. Lori, do you okay. like that idea? She doesn't like that idea at all. Uh, so, uh, okay, so I think that the agencies that have had that, I mean, you heard Adolfo, FHA modernization is necessary because, in part because they are still using COBOL. And the COBOL programmers are dying it's ridiculous. out. Yes. It's ridiculous. It is beyond ridiculous. I mean, I think, you know, um, I would like, I, I agree for, I definitely agree on the need for greater transparency at the FHFA, but I think it's actually running in an extremely flexible, um, overall, you know, very functional fashion. I mean, I'd like to see greater transparency, but that's probably the only change I'd make. Doug, did you, were you serious when you were talking about putting Fannie and Freddie in the HUD? After listening to them talk about the big stacks of paper, I'm saying, oh my God. Uh, I mean, look, I mean, look, because they're, they're not a government agency, but they're also, there are no profits for them, they can just throw money at their technology platform. Why not? They're spending a lot of money. Why not? They, there's no incentive to not. And so, you know. So, uh, actually, I, sort of, so basically, your plan is actually a lot, you know, let, let's put HUD and the GSEs um, together. Uh, sorry, let's put FHA and the GSEs together and sort of, um, is actually, you know, as a, as a big government agency, is actually not that different than the, than the Perry, than the Parrot Zandy plan last year. I, I don't want to end up there. That wouldn't be my first choice. But I think that would acknowledge the reality. These these are government agencies in disguise. They are they have this terrible set of incentives, like you know, to just throw money into a technology platform. FHA needs a technology platform. We ought to be doing these things cohesively in a, in a holistic fashion. So if, if you're if you're just acknowledging the situation as it is right now, they they there's a, a case to be made for putting them together. I, we have a few more minutes. Any any last couple questions? Maybe one or two more. I, I have one more question on afford, affordable housing. Okay, like duty to serve, FHA, HUD. It, it keeps getting lost in this con the broader conversation. I, I think, and I, um, it's becoming I think more of an imperative uh, going forward. And it seems also to be something that's kind of tripped up legislation in the past decade. So, just very quickly. Um, is, is there any incentive to, to, is there a problem, number one, and do you see any, again, administrative fixes coming down the pike, or would you recommend any administrative fixes, assuming you think there is a problem with affordability? Can I whine first? Uh, well, just, <laughs> just a little just, whine? Yeah. Anytime you have an affordability problem, whether it's housing, higher education, health care, the solution is to subsidize more demand. That will never make things cheaper. So, the problem is supply. Figure out how to get more homes, multifamily, single family, I don't care, built. And that's largely not a federal place. That's, and, and that's why it's so frustrating to federal officials. Agree. Yeah, well, that, was easy. that was an easy fix. There are actually Let's things you can do with the margin. You can tie federal transit money to greater density. But those are all really marginal. I mean, I was right at the it, it, the very nature, it's a local problem. And actually, the, I would argue that the, agents, the federal agencies do actually have the ultimate nuclear bomb, which is that they could say, we're not lending unless you have as a right development. But nobody's, yeah, nobody's going to go there. Go but I mean, could, are there smaller tweaks that could be made in terms of like, you know, modular housing, you know, financing modular housing, or, you know, mobile homes keep coming up every, you know. So, I mean, are the duty to serve plans enough, or are they just like no, sort of they're, not, not even they're not, they're not, not even they're, no no so um, so on the modular so let's talk about um, modular housing. I mean, right now, um, manufactured housing conforms to federal standards. Modular housing has to conform to state and local mm -hmm. standards. You could probably reduce the price a bit by by allowing modular housing to conform to federal standards rather than state and local standards. Um, and that would that that would make a lot of sense, but then you know the, the Florida administrators would say, "Well, wait a second, you want to overturn our our you know our new hurricane standards?" 
um, it's, it's a mess. Yeah. But I mean, that, you know, that is one concrete step that could be taken is to allow modular housing to be worked by these standards. Okay, so five years from now, we'll be back on the stage talking about GSEs and housing and what's it going to look like. Yeah, it'll be the same discussion. Yeah. Same discussion. So housing prices will be twice as high and wage growth will be about the same. Risk? Risk will be way up. Political incentive to act five years from now? Poor. Yeah. 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 Just where we are now. GSC shareholders? Will they have given up by then? No. Never give up. We'll never give up. <laughs> there, are free great, there are two great tail risks in life. One is they'll be free and they collect, and the other is that we have a crash. Any last questions? I have a question. Tony has a question for you. <laughs> I wish Adolfo was here today. Why does it take an FHA so long? <laughs> it's so long. When I moved here in 2009, they stored the stacks of paper, and there's 10 years later, they're still. Uh, you talking about FHA? Yeah, FHA. Oh my gosh, it. yeah. It's amazing. Because their systems, their systems can't accommodate the PDF files. And so they have to deliver them in paper form. That was my point. It's a computer. We, we can't rely on them for unless they do truly modernize to get a bigger budget to do it. Well, they're talking and about user fees, right? We've yes, seen and efforts at modernization. Go visit the IRS. That's not actually having more money is not a guarantee we'll get. That's true. That's true. Right. So until then, you know, they're carting stacks of paper too. It's like Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? The boxes go into the archives, and there they sit. All right, on that half. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, the no, they, they actually pay the archives to store FHA right, right, right. loan funds. Okay, that's a, another topic. I was lost in your analogy. Sorry. <laughs> so, right. regaining my role as uh, President of I want to thank the moderator, thank the other panelists, and thank you for coming today. Appreciate it very much.